Thank you for joining us. We will wait a few more moments to begin as people continue to log on. Thank you for joining us. We will begin in just a moment. Thank you to everyone for being here. Melissa Grisolfi, Dean of the Martha Rivers Ingram Commons, will begin. Thank you, Kate. Um, I am so glad to welcome you all here this evening, the evening here in Nashville, for a webinar for first year students and families. My name is Melissa Grisolfi. I'm Dean of the Ingram Commons. I'm also a professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning. I know you have many questions and I will endeavor to answer as many as we can tonight. If you have questions that are still unanswered at the end, or if you wanna just keep apprised of the most up-to-date information, I encourage you to visit www.vanderbilt.edu backslash coronavirus. We also have a helpline that you can call if questions that you have aren't appearing on that site. That number is 615-322 four, three, five, seven. And if you could just advance the slide a little bit, I think those will come up, thank you. Um, and then also you can always just email us at the commons at vanderbilt.edu. Okay, next slide. Um, tonight, I'm gonna focus on the many ways we've been planning since April for students' well-being, and specifically how we plan to support students to develop the same strong community that has always characterized the first year experience on the Martha Rivers Ingram Commons. One thing I want to make very clear is that like every year, the Commons experience includes every single first year student, regardless of where they're living. Tonight, I'll explain quite a bit about how we're gonna make that happen, but I know this is a concern that's been raised by a lot of students and families, so I wanted to make that point very clear. I want you to know how very many people are paying attention to working on and planning for first year students. First year students have many different people who look out for them. Each undergraduate college, Arts and Sciences, Blair, Engineering, and Peabody has a dean, many associate deans, and of course, hundreds of faculty and staff who personally advise every first year student. We also have the office of the dean of the students, whose office is responsible for maintaining community standards, overseeing housing and student safety and well-being, and supporting the over 700 student organizations that we have here at Vanderbilt. The Office of the Vice Provost for Academic Achievement oversees all of the identity centers here on campus, the Bishop Joseph J Johnson Black Cultural Center, the Office of Inclusive Excellence, LGBTQI Life, Margaret Cunningham Women's Center, and the University Chaplain in Religious Life. And then finally, we have the residential college system itself. Could you just advance one more, please? Um, led by the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and the Dean of the Residential Faculty, the residential college system provides access to a network of experiential learning resources, beginning with the first year experience. The Office of the Vice Provost brings together all cross-college academic initiatives, including things like the libraries, the Office of Immersion Resources, and the Career Center and most relevant for my presence here today, the Ingram Commons. These colleges, offices, and teams are working together and independently to ensure that students have a great 
fall. Here on the Ingram Commons, our primary goal is to foster community that connects with and supports students across their experiences here at Vanderbilt. We focus on five goals for our programming, all of which are supported through rich faculty engagement and connection with resources across the campus. This is what I'll focus on tonight, what we're doing on the Ingram Commons to support students to develop a strong community and to ensure their personal well-being. And next slide. We frame our programming in terms of our top priority, our community. This year, creating a safe and inclusive community is quite a different task. In addition to our focus on inclusivity, on access, and on anti-racism, this year, we also need to attend closely to the ways we keep each other safe. Here on the Commons, we have residents aging in age, ranging in age from four to almost 70 years old, and that's just the people who live here. When we include the staff, the faculty and students across all programs, this is truly an intergenerational campus. Although it's getting increasingly clear that no age group is immune from or does not suffer from COVID-19, it's easy to think it won't happen to me. But contracting, co contracting COVID-19 can happen to anyone and we all together share this space. So our top priority is making sure that we keep everyone safe on campus by making sure we all follow the guidelines to keep it a safe place for all students, all staff, all faculty, and all families. Next slide. However, our plan to keep you safe does not involve locking you in your rooms. It does not involve limiting your interaction only to your computer. It does not involve limiting your interaction with your family. This was by far the most popular question we received for the webinar. And I want to assure you, as a professor who has supervised hundreds of students, as the Dean of the Commons who connects with thousands of students, and as a mother myself, I completely understand the concern that students might be isolated. It's difficult to imagine what this year will look like when all you can imagine clearly is what it won't look like. I hope that by the end of today, your vision of the first year experience will be clearer and that you feel reassured about the scope of the planning and that many, many people who care about and are looking out for our first year students. Uh, next slide, please. How are we planning to ensure that you connect with others, meet people, form friendships, get involved with student groups, our usual goal for first year students? This year, our plans look different, but I want to assure you that they have not been abandoned. In addition to the informal communities that you'll develop through your classes, through student organizations that you join, and through your casual interactions around campus, there are two different intentionally designed communities that all first year students will be a part of, your house community and your Vanderbilt Visions group. Next slide. Here's how it will work. Students, as you know, who live on campus will live in singles, with the exception of student athletes, and will live on the commons in the fall or in the spring. Students will move between semesters with support from the university. Everyone will have a house affiliation composed of students who are living in the house in the fall, living in it in the spring, and not living in it at all, either because a student is studying remotely or because they are a student athlete assigned to live elsewhere. I know that not everyone knows their student affiliation yet, and this is something that we are rapidly working to finalize. We are very optimistic that you will hear, hopefully by the end of next week, which house you're affiliated with. Next slide. The houses on the commons are one of the first places that students create their communities. In the past year, in past years, where you live also corresponds to which house you're affiliated with. Obviously this year will be different. You might wonder, how could I possibly feel like I'm part of a house community if I'm living on main campus or if I'm living in another country entirely? It's a question we've also been asking ourselves, but luckily we've been working on this now for months and we have a great team of faculty and staff who are both creative and collectively have decades of experience here on the Commons. Each faculty head of house holds an appointment here at the university, which means that you have chances to connect with expertise across the university, regardless of what your major is. In fact, faculty engagement is a huge part of what makes the Commons experience special. And your faculty head is actually just the first of many who you will connect with outside of your classes. Let me give you some examples of what we plan to do. Each house has a weekly gathering that is informal 
and meant to offer an opportunity to check in, to see each other, and generally take a break from the evening's activities. Because our gathering size is so limited, the signature events have to look different this year. There's no way that 200 people are gonna be gathering in the standball lobby. So signature events will be virtual this year. Once a week, every house will offer a way for students to gather online. This means people who are living in the house, people who are living on main campus, and people who are living around the world. Everyone is still deep in their planning for specifics, but here are some examples of what some houses have been thinking. Murray House, building off their usual theme of Murray Munchies, is turning things virtual by taking turns getting to know each other through home and through home culture and communities. As someone born in the Midwest, one of my cultural foods is Jello salad. So perhaps there are some benefits to shifting to the virtual this year and sharing stories and images instead of eating actual food. Likewise, Sutherland is continuing its cherished tradition of cafecito, a weekly gathering that brings small groups of students together around an unknown theme. This year, cafecito will be virtual so that everyone who is part of the house can participate. The thing that brings you together is sometimes obvious, but sometimes not. Last year, I was invited to a cafecito because I had played an instrument as a child that I no longer played. As you might imagine, it took us a lot of conversation and quite some time to figure out what that thing was that we had in common. And finally, Stamball House has been playing with the idea of hybrid events, activities where you can learn something with new tools and toys. These events would involve picking up materials in advance and then connecting online to learn a new skill led by an expert. Next slide. In addition to weekly signature events, houses have other events that happen less frequently, perhaps once a month or every couple of weeks. These events will again be virtual, but will be advertised as they are developed. Some ideas that have been planned so far include virtual workouts with Dr. Noble, and I will warn you, he's been doing these all summer, so people are gonna have some catching up to do. Virtual movie nights with, doc with Dr. Dobson. Dr. D studies race and film, among other things, and is currently working on a project about the role of family in The Fast and the Furious, so watching movies with him is a treat. Virtual game nights with Dr. Zeller. Storytelling with Dr. Meadows, who is Associate Director of the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities, knows a lot about helping students to craft their stories. And Trivia Nights with Dr. McClure, creating chances for students to learn about Vanderbilt and about each other. And finally, oh, next slide please. Finally, there will be chances for students to gather together in person. Vanderbilt's current gathering guidelines limits us to 10 people in a group, socially distanced and wearing masks. Faculty heads have already generated a huge list of such events, which include yoga, gardening, painting, playing games such as cornhole, gathering around one of our many fire pits on the lawns, gathering outside with guest faculty for extended discussions, and maybe even some outdoor movie watching. These outdoor activities are planned to take place both on the commons and also on main campus and we'll have a strict RSVP policy so we can ensure that we are following the university's guidelines for gathering size. All of the house programming is open to any first year student, although people typically prioritize the events of their house. In addition, the Commons also hosts a series of activities that are open to all students. Along with everyone else, we're working on the specific details of our plans, but we're working currently on a series of programs that combine the virtual with small in-person in events. For example, we have a series of programming on personal well-being that combine physical and mental health activities, a series on art and, art and, art and activism, where we learn about the Gies Bend quilting community and their role in the civil rights movement, ending in, partner, <coughs> excuse me, in activities that partner with the Curb Center, where we learn about how to quilt ourselves and the relationship between art and activism. We will, of course, have a series of programs about voting this year, where we have an opportunity to learn about the history of voting um, through film and through books and give students opportunities to register themselves. And then finally, we have a series of talks that we call this year Fireside Chats, which are small gatherings where we can talk about practically everything. All of these activities are open to all students and most of them are virtual so that students can join wherever they are. Last but not least, one of the cherished uh, traditions of the Commons is the Commons Cup, which is a year-long friendly competition between the houses. 
The Commons Cup is a first year tradition intended to promote the creation of both house communities and to create community across the Commons. The Commons Cup consists this year of four categories, academics, athletics, community involvement, and service and sustainability. Students participate throughout the academic year to earn points within each category. Um, and then the winner is, is the group that earns the most points across the year. As with every year, all first year students are invited and encouraged to participate in the Commons Cup. And I will tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, that Murray House won the Commons Cup in 2020 and Dr. Hasty, I know, already has plans to keep that cup. So we really hope that everyone participates and gives Murray a run for their money. The second community that all first year students will be part of is their visions group. All first year students will be assigned to one of 93 visions groups. These groups, each of which is made up of about 18 first year students, meet weekly throughout the semester. Visions groups help you form strong connections and support networks with, class with classmates across different houses, schools, perspectives, and geographical backgrounds, and help you with the transition to becoming a, suc a successful college student. This picture is obviously from last year, since we're squished together and we're not wearing masks, but I wanted to share it with you so that you could see the scope of the community and the, the scope and size of the community who is committed to these first year seminars. Each visions group is run by a faculty member and an upper division student peer mentor called student and faculty view centers. Visions is a very special place. It's one of the first places where you have sustained conversations with the same group of people. Even though we only meet for 50 minutes per week, we cover a lot. This year, all Visions meetings will be virtual because of the size of the seminars and because we want to make sure that all members of the first year class can participate. Next slide. Upper Division View Scepters have been preparing all summer to welcome the first year students. The View Sept exec Executive Board has been planning for fall orientation leader training, which is a week long series of activities that helps upper division students prepare to connect with and support first year students. All View Scepters have been meeting in small groups monthly this summer to talk about programming and to get their heads around the ways that they'll be connecting with their visions groups. We call students in the visions groups View Septees. These upper division students are your first important connection to the rest of the student body. And the group of view scepters reflects the diversity of backgrounds, interests, majors, extracurriculars, and countries as the rest of our student body. As upper division students, they have gone through exactly what the first year students are about to experience. Well, maybe this year not exactly, but they are an, and they are always an important resource for learning about Vanderbilt, about classes, and about the ins and outs of campus. All visions groups meet weekly to discuss a variety of ideas. Um, first and foremost, they talk about the academic and social opportunities here on Vanderbilt. We talk about the strategies and challenges of maintaining a good balance between physical health, mental health, and commitment and, uh, and um, belonging in, the, um, in organizations. Uh, we talk a lot about the available university resources that promote academic and personal success. And finally, we spend a lot of time talking about how we build our community by supporting everyone to develop an awareness about the new ideas, perspectives, and experiences of the very diverse community that we have at Vanderbilt and the individual role each of us plays in promoting an inclusive and supportive environment. This year, we have a very useful tool to help us do just that. Uh, next slide, please. And that is the Commons Reading. This year we're reading The You You Mean to Be, and the book is about the ways that we, uh, the ways that personal bias work and how to become more critical about the biases that we use to understand the world. I know that lots of you have already received the Commons Reading because I've been emailing and corresponding with several students. If you haven't, it is on its way. Um, along with that book, you will have a, you will receive a letter from me and also instructions for submitting the, an essay, which is due August 24th. This is a short essay, only 250 words, but we use it as an opportunity for uh, the view sectors use it as an opportunity to get to know their view septees through the lens of the commons reading. Next slide. Um, I want you to know that it's not just residential colleges that's working on programming. Offices around the university are working closely partnered with students to design for new community this fall. 
I want to share one specific example that comes from a dive boot camp run by Dr. Kevin Galloway, who's the director of DIVE, which stands for Design as an Immersive Vanderbilt Experience, and the director of Making at the Wondery, a makerspace partnered with the School of Engineering here on campus. In this dive boot camp, Dr. Galloway introduced students to the, pra students to the practices of user-centered design and offered a design challenge. How could we decrease barriers for entry for campus groups and individuals in order to ease the process of engaging with community? The first step of user-centered design is to develop insight into and empathy for the community with which you're designing. Students interviewed fellow students to learn about their concerns about the upcoming school year and then proposed a series of activities to address those challenges. I'll share two here. Next slide. Uh, the first is called Catherine Dated um, and offers free coffee as a need to connect people either in person or virtually. These small drop in connections, as we know, can sometimes form the basis of long lasting friendships. Um, a second um, idea, oops, sorry, next slide. A second idea involves the ways that students help communicate their COVID experiences with other students through storytelling and social media. Again, the goals of these activities are to help students get to know each other, to connect across their multiple platforms and experiences. Next slide. Orientation this year is going to be online. Modules will be available starting August 15th, and we ask everyone to complete these modules by August 31st. These online activities will give you an opportunity to explore and learn about Vanderbilt University, our community, our practices, and the many resources the university has to offer. By the time classes start on August 24th, you will be ready to hit the ground running. Next slide. Despite all of our goals, plans, and efforts, I don't want to pretend that this won't be different or that it won't be hard. It will be. Everyone will be spending more time alone than they might otherwise. In fact, I would venture to guess that everyone on this webinar tonight is in the middle of being more isolated than we would be in normal times. Students are coming back to campus, but no one expects that being here will be business as usual. And we know that being more isolated creates stress, worry, anxiety, and depression. For that reason, I wanted to make sure to share tonight a little bit about how the students, how student support and mental health services work here on campus. We have a multi-pronged approach to supporting students through the Student Care Network, which is coordinated by the Office of Student Care Coordination. The Office of Student Care Coordination fosters well-being and success by identifying concerns and coordinating support for students facing life events that may interfere with their academic or personal goals. Anyone with a concern about themselves or about someone else can reach out to the Office of Student Care Coordination and complete a student of concern report, and they will develop an individually fo tailored follow-up plan for that student. The OSCC helps to determine what kind of help a student might need and relies on the many offices that are part of the student care network to meet those needs. For example, the Center for Student Wellbeing includes many preventative and responsive activities, such as academic, peer, academic and peer coaching, academic skill support, recovery support services, weekly well-being practices such as meditation, skill building workshops, and awareness and prevention programming. The University Counseling Center services include urgent care counseling, one-on-one -on -one counseling appointments, group therapy, and workshops for groups. And finally, the Student Health Center is our point for COVID-19 assessment, as well as for routine health care. And final slide. I hope it is clear that we have a lot of plans to make sure that students are connected, both to each other and to many faculty. Between virtual events and small in-person events in the houses, visions meetings and connections with view sectors, we have many, many ways to be together. However, staying together requires that everyone do their part, everyone does their part here on campus. Students must follow university, city, and state guidelines and do their very best to ensure that they neither contract nor spread COVID-19. Families, we ask for your help in ensuring that your family practices support and bolster our efforts here on the, at the university. Everyone wants to have a great fall semester, but having a great fall semester will take all of our collective sacrifices, efforts, and care.
Now that I've shared some of our plans, I want to take some time to respond to the many questions that you've all shared with us. Joining us today is a panel who will help clarify um, as many things as possible. I want to introduce them briefly before they share some of their answers. And panelists, when I introduce you, if you just wave so everyone knows who you are. Um, I'm going to start with the faculty heads who are part of the residential colleges team. First, Dr. Frank Dobson is the faculty head of House of Gillette House, and this is his 13th year as a faculty head. Dr. Dobson, actually the students call him Dr. D, is also the Associate Dean of the Commons and the Director of the Posse Program. Dr. D is a writer and a poet whose scholarship focuses on race and belonging across media genres. We also have Dr. Natasha McClure, who is the faculty head of North House. This is her third year as a faculty head. Dr. McClure is also an associate professor of nursing and teaches in the primary care pediatric nurse practitioner and doctor of nursing practice programs at VUSN. Her work focuses on improving access to asthma care and resources in low resource, high need schools. Dr. McClure partners with the United Way and Metro Nashville Public Schools to deliver enhanced care services to children with asthma who are chronically absent from school. Dr. Dobson and Dr. McClure are here today to answer your questions and to help us get a better sense of the house level programming that's available here on the Commons. We also have with us tonight two members of the Office of Housing and Residential Experience. Allison Matarisi is the Director of Housing Assignments. She's been very busy lately for the Office of Housing and Residential Experience. Allison has been with Vanderbilt University since 2009. During that time, she supported or directed nearly every aspect of housing that takes place on our campus. Allison is going to help answer your questions related to the logistics of housing and help overview the move-in process for us. Randy Tarkington is the Senior Director of Residential Experience. His role involves directing and supervising the residential staff, including area coordinators and RAs, who are frontline in providing support for student safety and well-being. Mr. Tarkington has been at Vanderbilt since 2006, and during that time has developed a well-deserved reputation for his deep commitment to and concern for students. He's here with us to help us understand the work being done to address student well-being. And last but not least, David Turkile is the Executive Director for Business Services. Part of that position includes dining services, which includes a very large group of managers and dining staff. Mr. Turkile is here today to help us get a better sense of dining plans for the fall. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, Mr. Tarkington, I'm gonna start with you and ask you the first question. We've had a lot of questions and concerns about students being isolated. Can you tell us a little bit about the role RAs will play and the way they're being prepared to help support students' connectedness and mental health this year? Thank you and welcome everyone. It, it's raining here and thundering, so you may hear a little storming in the background, um, which we needed by the way, so we'll take it. Um, so yeah, the, we resumed with the RAs a couple of weeks ago and they were very excited about coming back and were full of ideas already. And one of the things we started years ago was a program called Meaningful Conversations. These RAs are outstanding leaders, just outstanding leaders. And we wanted them to be able to bring their skills and their knowledge in a very proactive way we built this program called Meaningful Conversations so they could do proactive outreach to their residents, which we're gonna even expand this year. So it's been a lot of time getting to know residents, helping connect them to resources, helping connect students to the places on campus where they can be successful. So, and we're gonna do a lot of, 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 of everyone else working with our faculty heads and doing some virtual programming. But I think RAs also are gonna be really important as they get to know residents to be able to connect them to one another. Right, if they find somebody who has an interest in music, connect them to someone else on the floor who has an interest in music. So a lot of the informal kind of uh, programming can happen where students on their own take the initiative to do things. RAs will be constantly providing new ideas and ways for residents to engage with each other. You'll find a lot of our programming virtually to begin with because again, safety is gonna be a really important um, aspect as we begin the year. Uh, but also very aware if, as, if there are any issues that we connect those quickly. So one of the things we really pride ourselves on is trying to identify a problem early on and connecting students to the resources. So RAs are great about that. If we get a report from a, a, from a professor who's concerned about a student maybe who's not engaging like they used to, we'll still follow up on that quickly and work with RAs and area coordinators and to, to find the best resource to get that student connected to. So we can identify very early on to keep students on the road to be successful. Uh, I'm excited to have RAs back. We're gonna talk about when they get back, things to do when students arrive, between when you arrive, if you arrive on the first day till classes begin, we're gonna be 
brainstorming ideas of some activities to do, some things to do to keep students engaged in that time. So um, they're very excited. They've expressed that to me. We're excited to have you back and we're gonna work really hard to create really engaged communities. And we, we really can't wait for you to be back here and looking very much forward to it. Thank you. Um, Dr. McClure, I'm gonna ask you the next question. <clears throat> Can you just give us a sense of the team of people in North House who are connecting with and looking out for students? Yes, welcome everyone. I'd like to share about the North House team, which includes me and a resident advisor for each floor of residence in North. We have six floors and a professional staff member called an area coordinator who are all an important part of the community building process here. Our staff will operate as one team to program so that regardless of physical location, each resident is able to build the same connections to one another via our shared community culture, which we focus on a culture of care here. The purpose of our events and this team of people is to connect and learn about one another so that each resident, regardless of where they are located physically, develops a sense that North is home, not just a room within a building with a space where they sleep and study. So we thrive on change and challenge here at VU and this year will be no different with regard to the creative ways that we as a North House team and all the other Commons Houses um, offer activities to bring every resident together to develop a sense of belonging within our community. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Dr. D, I want to ask you also a question about the, the houses. Can you share a little bit about the in-person gatherings you've been imagining for Gillette House? Who will be invited to participate in those in-person gatherings? And how are you going to make sure they follow the university regulations? Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, welcome to all of you. I, I'm delighted to talk about this. Um, I've kind of adopted uh, one of my famous, old, famous favorite old sitcoms. You may remember, some of you, I'm dating myself, the sitcom Eight is Enough. And that's kind of the rule that we're using where it'll be myself and perhaps one of my RAs or my wife and then eight residents. And so we'll cap it at eight. Eight is enough. And what we're really looking at is inviting all of our residents. And by residents, I mean not only those who are living in Gillette, but those who are living on the other side of campus, depending upon the respective uh, semester. And we're really looking at, as, as my uh, colleague, Professor McClure said, engendering community and making sure that everyone who's part of Gillette feels a part of Gillette. And of course, any gathering that we have when we are adopting the eight is enough rule, we're also going to be making sure that we're socially distanced and we're wearing our masks. That's the theme, right? We are wearing our masks. We want to say that as many times as possible. Uh, Mr. Tarkington, we've had a lot of questions about whether the residences can be thought of as an informal pod. Can you tell us if that's possible? And if not, why not? Yeah, you know, we, we have had a lot of conversations about manners in which we bring students back and we do it safely. And as you can imagine, we're certainly going to start the year in a far more um, conservative approach to make sure we can start out and, and be able to keep students safe. And so at this point in time, following guidelines and CDC guidelines, we think it's best to not do that, to continue to encourage students to find ways to create, you know, maybe your own safe pods, right? So for example, there'll be a lot of opportunities to, we have a lot of beautiful outdoor space to find a way to go outside with a couple of friends and grab some, some lunch or dinner and sit down in the grass and socially distance with three or four and have conversations and create that kind of happening which we can still bring people together but do it safely, right? And I think as we begin to see the semester goals, we have some ideas of music from phase one to phase two, phase three, right, phases. And, and so I think as we continue to see what happens, we can revisit things, but certainly we're going to start with the idea that we're gonna do everything safely and do it within the aspects of social distancing, wearing masks, but we'll, we'll be providing lots of ideas, like through the faculty head, through the RAs, with ideas of ways in which you can gather as friends and find ways to communicate uh, to kind of address that isolation. But the idea of actually forming pods at this point in time, we feel like that's not the best way to start. Thank you. Um, so let me keep asking a couple more questions about the residences. Um, Dr. D, can you share a little bit about the monthly connections with faculty members that you have planned? Absolutely. I was just talking with a faculty colleague this, this uh, afternoon who said to me, 
make sure that you invite me. Now these um, faculty connections this year will be virtual, but um, we've already lined up a number of them from across the campus. And because the connections will be virtual, we can sort of add uh, more than we would normally have at a dinner around the table. So that's, that's one of the perks. So we're gonna cap those at about 20 or 25. And um, we're, we're also really looking at, for our motto this year, Jeanette, Gillette Gathering connecting and strengthening. And when I say connecting and, and, and gathering, I mean virtually or in person. And what we're really looking at in terms of these virtual connections for the faculty dinners are a motto that we're really looking at the whole notion of what Dr. King talked about in, in terms of the civil rights movement, the beloved community, and really how we can, whether it's virtually or in person, articulate our connection with one another through talking with the faculty will be virtual about any number of the problems and things that we that are confronting us in our country, but also about how we as a Vanderbilt community can become closer with one another and strengthen one another, even in the midst of a crisis that's affecting all of us. That's great. Thank you. Um, Dr. McClure, can you share a little bit about what you've been planning to connect, the ways you've been planning to connect to all the students in North House, regardless of where they're living? Yes, so I'd start by saying our first campus event as a house will bring residents together by their north floor, regardless of their physical location, with me and their RAs to customize their first North House Vanderbilt article of clothing in a virtual t-shirt screen printing event. Our goal is to bring residents together virtually or in socially distanced events, alternating between commons and main campus locations to make it convenient for everyone and to make everyone feel that they're being included. And here at North, our weekly event has been called Snorthisborg. You have to say it three times really quickly to get into it, which won't be such a problem this year since we'll be doing it virtually, hybrid, in, in a variety of different ways. So if anyone's here and you get assigned to North, you have plenty of time to practice. Um, but we'll have hybrid events and a mixture of in-person events um, in physically distance, of course, that blend Zoom, Instagram Live, and other media platforms so that if students want to attend something they don't feel comfortable yet, they can certainly join in a variety of different ways. Our monthly events are called North Nights, and that's where guests join us for dinner and discussion. Um, we are planning to have, hopefully, some outdoor space where we have plenty of physical distancing options available so that we can see people in person and then people can join, residents can join remotely. So we're looking really forward to offering a number of different ways to help everyone feel connected in their own safe way, whatever they feel comfortable with. And so we're excited to welcome everybody to North this year. Thank you. So I hope, so this team of people, I hope has given you some insight into the sort of multi-pronged approach we have to thinking about connecting to students, connecting students with each other, and making sure that people are finding their communities here on campus. Dr. McClure and Dr. Dobson described two totally different models, and that's how it works here on the Commons. Each house has its own community, its own set of events that are open to everyone, but each house develops its own sort of sense of what it means to be a member. Um, and that's gonna happen this year, just like every other year. I know there are also a lot of logistical questions. And so um, I'm gonna turn our questions over away from community and more towards what's gonna happen. Um, so Allison, um, could you please just describe the move-in process this year? How is it gonna work? When will students and families know what day they've been assigned to move in? You know, give us the short overview, please. Absolutely. Welcome everyone. Um, we look forward to having your students on campus in just a few short weeks. Regarding move-in this year, we are actually currently in the midst of move-in sign-up. Um, rather than having one distinct move-in day, move-in will actually take place over the course of an entire week. Students can select a time between Monday, August 17th and Saturday, August 22nd. These move-in times are in one-hour increments and they begin at 8 a.m. each day and they go until 4 p.m. each day, except on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday where we're extended to 7 p.m. This can all be done in the student housing portal. And if your student is having any issues with this, please encourage them to contact us via email um, at o'hare at vanderbilt.edu. We're happy to assist. 
regarding the actual move-in process, once students arrive on campus, they're going to be directed to a symptom check station. That is where they will be checked for symptoms as well as their, their assistant or their helper. Um, upon the symptom check that we have, we will then direct them to their residence hall where they'll be able to unload their belongings and get their items up to their room. Um, after the unloading happens, then they'll be redirected to parking locations. We'll then, and then the student and obviously the helper will be permitted to be in and out of the building throughout the day in order to get the room set up. I know there have been a lot of questions about, am I only limited to this one hour? Is my assistant allowed to be in the building beyond that point? And they absolutely are. We recognize that it's going to take longer than an hour to be able to get items into the building and get your room set up. Um, we also recognize that you may need to run to Target or Walmart to pick up some additional items, as well as pick up items that you've had shipped here. So we're partnering with mail services on package pickup to try to make this as simple as possible. I will say that we will be sending additional communication to all students in the week leading up to move in that will give exact details on exactly where you'll be directed to go for symptom checking and then what the steps are going to look like from that point. So make sure that your students are continuing to regularly check their email for that information. That's great. Um, do you know when students could expect to find out when their move in slot will be? Absolutely. As students sign up, once they select their time, that is their confirmed time. Um, students are welcome to change that if they would like. We are currently doing um, phases of move in sign up. So there'll be several first year students that will be continuing that tomorrow. And then beginning Monday, if students would like to log back into the housing portal in order to change or adjust their times, they're welcome to do so beginning Monday, August 3rd. Okay, great. I'm going to keep you in the hot seat because we have another question about move in. Um, a lot of families are distressed about the rule that only one person can help students move into their residence. Can you explain why that rule is in place and help us understand what happens after move-in? Can the other parent come onto campus? Can the student leave campus to hang out? Give us a sense of that part, please. Absolutely. We recognize that beginning college in the midst of a pandemic is stressful for both students and their families. Please know that this decision was ultimately made to help support the safety of our entire student body and to help ensure that we can have a successful fall semester on campus. Moving in several thousand students you know, in over a week long period while social distancing, as you can imagine, presents a lot of unique challenges. One of the main concerns is that each additional person who enters the residence halls is another possible source of exposure to our students and their families. Our move-in plans were developed under the guidance of public health officials with a strategy focused on risk reduction. By limiting the number of people in the residence halls, we hope to limit potential exposure of the virus to those participating in the move-in process. While only one assistant will be cleared to enter the residence hall, other family members are permitted to be on campus following our social distancing guidelines and our mask wearing protocol. Students are permitted to leave. However, we ask that they abide by the local guidelines regarding social distancing and mask wearing. Again, this decision, it was not made lightly, but please know that we share the same goals. We want your student to remain healthy and we want them to have a successful first year here at Vanderbilt. Thank you. Um, and Nashville guidelines are changing daily just as they are in every city. So it's a good idea in addition to keep your, keeping your eye on the Vanderbilt coronavirus site, Keep, keep your eye on the um, Nashville regulations as well. Um, so Mr. Chikail, can you, um, people are also really trying to figure out what is dining gonna look like. So could you lead us through a meal? Where would a student go to get their meal? Will they have choice in what they get? And then what do they do after they get their meals? Where are they gonna go and eat? Yeah, well, Melissa, thanks for having me. Um, we're always excited to uh, welcome first year students on the campus. Uh, this is exciting time of the year. Um, so we will have uh, the six dining halls, which will function as your uh, traditional dining hall. Those are located at Rand uh, 2301, which is an allergen free uh, location. Uh, of course, at the Commons, E. Bronson Ingram, uh, Kassam Kitchen, and uh, Zeppos. And what those will look like is It'll be your traditional setup. Um, students will wait in line, six foot distance, of course, um, and come up to the line and our servers behind a plexiglass barrier wearing um, safety PPE will, um, the student will select their protein, sides, dessert, and a drink. That'll be packaged up to go. 
And then the student um, also has the option to purchase two more meals to go if they would like. Those would be a box lunch um, or box breakfast. So if you're having a busy day or you may not be able to get to a dining location, um, you can pick up an extra meal, take it back to your room with you. Um, in addition to the traditional dining halls, we've got mobile ordering at 15 other locations. Um, and the way that that'll work is it's done through the Get app. Um, and we are setting it up, requesting that students order by midnight the night before. We understand that that is not always gonna be the case. So at these locations, in addition to the orders that we received um, the night before, day before, we'll have overproduced so that we will have meals at those pickup locations. Um, but I can tell you that variety, um, the students will have the option for variety if they order ahead, whereas since the meal's already made, um, the variety won't be there if they haven't uh, ordered the day before. But those locations, like I said, are 15 other locations. Um, you've got Greens, REAs, which is a kosher food truck, which is over across the street from Greens, the Kasam Market, um, Local Java, We've got four Susie's locations. Um, we've got four Munchie Marts, three lunch pickup locations, and then we'll also have two uh, locations for dinner pickup. Those will be over on the main campus for specifically for the first year students. Um, and that'll be in Carmichael Towers East and also in Branscombe. Um, and in addition to those two, we have the 30 Taste Nashville partners, and those will be off campus. Students can utilize uh, meal money or Commodore cash uh, to make that transaction. And then after uh, students get their meals there, we have, um, I'm sure you've seen them um, being constructed right now on campus. We have three large, they're called tents, but they're really structures um, across campus. One over by Rand, one at the library and over at the Peabody Esplanade, um, seating over 600 students. Uh, of course, any place on campus where they can socially distance and then um, the room as well. Wow, thank you. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of good choices and I know it's taken a tremendous amount of effort to try to reconfigure this whole system. Um, I have one more question though. In, in regular years, there are, in addition to all of the standard things that you just described, there are other ways that students can use their meal plan or their meal money. Can you um, tell us a little bit about what those options might be this year? Yeah, so the Vanderbilt uh, meal plan and uh, the way it's set up is unique to pretty much any uh, campus in the country. Uh, we have a very flexible meal plan structure and opportunities to redeem those. Typically, you can only use a meal swipe in a traditional dining hall, but here you can actually use it everywhere. Um, so that's not just at those dining halls, but you can also use them at the uh, Munchie Marts. Um, way we've set it up there is you can use a meal swipe. Uh, the meals that we've set up there uh, include salads, wraps. We've created a fresh plate brand, which is our to-go uh, meals. Amy's frozen meals, which I know everybody likes. Tasty Bite microwavable meals. Um, and all those meal packages are based on USDA serving size and the MyPlate model. Um, additionally, in the, in the munchies, um, they'll be able to, students will be able to get what's called a market basket, which will include fresh fruit, vegetables, uh, pantry items such as pasta, rice, beans. Um, but additionally, they can use meal money or Commodore cash in the markets to get uh, snacks, drinks, candy, things of that nature. A um, few other pieces of information, Melissa, if you don't mind if I pitch them. Um, uh, in addition to our social media platforms, um, if students or parents would text uh, dining news, all one word, to 55744, we are sending out daily updates on things that are going on across campus. Of course, that'll start once school begins. Um, also, the students will have loaded into the Get app. The first year students will have a reusable water bottle that can be ordered and picked up at the Munchie Marts, as well as a reusable uh, grocery bag. And then last thing, sorry, um, 
any students, first year students that are interested in learning about our dietary accommodations um, and uh, just understanding how we handle uh, food allergies or preferences that they can uh, visit and register for a dining accommodations um, meeting and that is at vu.edu backslash dining accommodations. So and that'll be for next week. Thank you. Um, I want to share that um, there are also plans in place in the event that students need to be quarantined and are too sick to use the Get app. We, are, we didn't have time to talk about it today, but I got to sit through a dining meeting today, so I heard all about it. So I just want you to know that basically every eventuality that we can imagine is being planned for at this point. So if you, of course, if you have a concern, you should always reach out. But if you can imagine it, we have probably imagined it too, and we have a plan in place for it. So um, just to highlight that that's happening. Um, I'm mindful of our time. So we just have a couple of, a couple last questions that I wanna make sure get asked. Um, Allison, a lot of people just have logistical questions like the size of things and what they can bring and all kinds of logistics, who knew? Um, where can they go to um, find the answers to these sort of logistical questions about the spaces themselves? Absolutely. Um, well, regarding items to bring, um, I know we've received several um, questions about that. So in your students assignment email that they received, we did provide campus partner and move in information links in that message. Um, one of those links includes just general residential living information and provides a suggested packing list of items, including some items that are more special to this year due to the current situation that we're managing. Um, that includes things like non disposable straws and cutlery hand sanitizer, cleaning supplies, uh, extra reusable water bottles, face masks, and even some outdoor blankets and seating. That way, if you wanna gather outside, you have something to sit on at that time. Um, we also on our website have additional information just on our buildings themselves, which I encourage students to go and visit those pages. For many of them, we have photographs that we've taken, um, even of just the class cohort from last year, as well as video tours. Now we do have a quite a bit of variety in our residential communities in regards to shape and size. So it really is impossible to give specific dimensions to each and every room, but we're gonna to continue to update our move-in information sites to provide as much information as possible so that way you can best plan. That's great, thank you. Um, um, and I, I did wanna just add a note that first year students who are on campus we're actually giving you picnic blankets because we are we are so very much wanting you to sit outside as much as possible. So bring your own, um, but we will be giving every single student who lives on campus a, a blanket because we're really trying, as I said, if you can imagine it, we can too. So we're trying to imagine all the ways that we can help people be together, distanced um, as much as possible in the safest possible um, conditions. Mr. Tarkington, I'm gonna have you add, um, answer our last question um, families are wondering just what can they do to support their students as they start their first year of college. Do you have any advice that you could offer? Oh, people who know me know I have advice for this. I, I love this question. Uh, I've been answering it for 15 years and I've been saying the same thing, but I will tell you in the age of COVID, it has even so much more significance. Um, I love to use a sports analogy of um, um, our football team, Coach Mason. You know, they don't just show up and get to the field and Coach Mason says, okay, go out and win. It doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of preparation and planning. So my challenge to all of you is what do you have a plan? Have you sat down as a family and thought about a plan for success? And what might that include? Well, it might include how do you communicate, right? Every year we get a phone call from a parent that says, I talk to my child every day at nine, two, and seven. I called at seven, they, they didn't answer, so something must be wrong. And my answer is yes, something's very wrong, and that's your communication plan, right? That is not a communication plan for success. So what does that look like? That should look like, how often are we gonna talk? And is it gonna be text, phone, FaceTime? Who's gonna call who? And if I'm supposed to call and I don't, what are you going to do, right? That level, what is your plan for communication? Because that's really important. And then what does that communication look like when it happens? I've talked to a lot of you already and you've said things like, Randy, I'm worried because my child's a little bit shy, right? And, and now they're in a room by themselves. So what I'm gonna say is, you're coming to a campus with so many resources. And it's really important to have a plan to take advantage of those resources. So maybe instead of waiting, be proactive and have a plan early on to connect with the Center for Student Wellbeing, 
to work on that skill, to get the skill set to be more outgoing, to figure out ways to make friends in this world that we live in COVID right now. So when that phone call happens, maybe the phone call is, you know, how to go this week to make you friends. Now that can't be every phone call because if every phone call is like the Inquisition, I'm not calling home anymore, right? So, but it could be sometimes, how's it going? If you pick up, it's not going well, then I'm gonna go back to the, to the analogy of sports. The best thing you can do is coach, right? Not stop in and solve their problems for them and call and say, Randy, my child's unhappy, fix it, right? It's how can you coach them? Have you talked to the RA? Have you been going to the appointments? And if you get really concerned and you feel like things are really bad, then you can reach out to us and say, I'm concerned and we can help connect to resources. So I think if you go into the avenue of I'm coaching, I have a plan for communication, trust your instincts. The other thing I'm gonna to say to you is this is gonna be stressful to you and it's okay to recognize that, right? In addition to COVID, life is gonna happen. Behind me, my backdrop is my patio. What you'll see on the, the right side of the patio or left side, wherever you're sitting, is my damage from the tornado in March, right? Now I got very fortunate because across the street from me, things are devastated and it, it, the tornado damage stopped right there. But my point is life is going to happen and you're gonna be stressed by not just COVID, but worried about your children. But this happens often is I'll get a call from a parent and it, you know, they're really, really concerned and things are just, they paint this picture that things are really, really bad. I call the student and they go, Randy, I'm fine. I, I'm fine, I'm sorry, that's just my mom, that's my dad, right? So sometimes you're projecting your anxiety on to them when they're actually okay. And so recognize that this, and even more so than ever, you're going to have stresses and what's your plan to take care of that also, right? And so keep that in mind as the year goes. I will tell you one thing is, I think you will see this, and it, even in, in a virtual world, we all really like each other a lot. We're a, uh, we've been chatting each other, you know, I haven't seen you in a while, it's great to see you, we work well together. We have a singular goal, and that is to create, a, a, you know, I stay in this profession because college was life-changing for me. Um, believe it or not, I was kind of shy when I went to college, and that experience was, was life-changing, and every student, I know I want, we all want to have that experience and we're working hard every day. We are in this together and we need your patience and your communication and your understanding. And, um, and, and then, you know, sit down as a family and, and develop that game plan. And if, in my experiences, when coaches develop really good game plans, most of the time they win, at least on some level. And we're here to help any way we can. And we're just excited for you to be here. And I promise you're working hard. We're gonna keep working hard. And, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're gonna do this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us tonight. It's been really helpful um, to hear about all of the plans and I hope it's been helpful for all of the families and students who are on this call. So I just wanna tell you about some next steps. Um, if you don't already, if you're not living on the Commons this fall, then you don't know your house affiliation yet. Those are, we are hoping that those are forthcoming next week. Um, once you get your house affiliation, follow the house on Instagram. The accounts are already starting to be active with reminders and plans. Um, follow us at Residential Colleges on Instagram and on Facebook if you haven't already, and look for your class pages on Facebook and Instagram. There was a question about how we are helping the first year students to meet each other, and I thought, oh no, we don't need to do that actually because they are meeting each other. So we have Facebook pages, Instagram pages for the class of 2024. We encourage you to join them. Um, one thing to know, vision, everyone I mentioned, everyone will have a vision assignment. A vision assignment appears on your schedule right now. It's just temporary. As you know, the schedule at the university is in the midst of getting reconfigured so we can make sure that we're keeping everyone as safe as possible. Um, and the, the revised schedule is forthcoming this week. As soon as that is finalized and the schedule is finalized, then your visions assignments will be finalized. When that happens, and those of us who are view scepters know who our students will be in our visions group, we will be reaching out to you. So um, for sure you'll be getting emails both from the student view scepters and likely from your faculty view scepters. Um, your student view scepters will be setting up connection sites like GroupMe for the visions group so people can get to know each other. So there are just, there's lots of upcoming connections, there's lots of upcoming information, and including we have some webinars planned for parents and families around the time of orientation keep your eye on your email. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at thecommons at vanderbilt.edu. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Bye everybody.